The Division 2 both is and is not what I expected. Yes, elements of it are very familiar, that much I expected, and yes, it generally is a bit more polished and considered in its design. Again, something that I expected. What I did not really expect is how these things would come together, really resulting in a game that is more than the sum of its parts. At first glance, The Division 2 seems like The Division 1 with a more colourful setting, and while it may very much be an evolution for people who played the final patch of The Division, for me, as someone who did not, The Division 2 has managed to feel rather revolutionary. So with that said, welcome back to another video on this channel. Today we are going to be reviewing The Division 2. I've played a whole lot of it, got into the end game, and uh, there really is quite a lot to talk about with this game. Of course, being the type of game that it is, let's just talk about the progression and the experience of playing it. As a Division agent, you are tasked with cleaning up Washington, dealing with all of the local baddies, and helping the friendly settlements develop. This really forms the meat of your journey from level 1 to 30, the game's cap, and this is done by completing missions, doing projects, completing side missions, and by doing various activities in the world. That, plus the progression of your character, equals the core experience of leveling up in The Division 2. When you look at your world map, it reveals a dizzying number of things to do. It might be overwhelming on first sight, but you soon do get used to it, slipping into your role as a Division agent, going around clearing up the streets. The Division 2 is actually quite successful at getting you into that flow state of play, being a remarkably potent time vampire, which is certainly a sign that the game's core loop is rather compelling. All gameplay is centered around combat, so that's what we're going to tackle first. I typically am bored to tears by third-person shooters, but that very much is not the case here. One of the most impressive things about The Division 2 is its ability to squeeze a lot of gameplay out of simple systems. They have managed to make encounters continually feel fresh, for weapons to feel varied, and for enemies with large health bars to not feel bullet spongy. And that is something that was one of my largest concerns with the game going into it. Movement is weighty and slick, I would say. It's an acquired taste, but it's something that I was fine with. More importantly, movement in cover is near perfectly executed, allowing for you to focus on angles and tactics. As for the shooting, it's highly varied. Each type of gun has a distinct role, and they all feel different to shoot, meaning that it is, amazingly, a third-person shooter with interesting weapons, which is something that I find this genre sort of struggles with, particularly a recent title like, say, Anthem. Personally, I have loved the bolt-action rifles. Sure, they're not as beefy and personal as in an FPS, but they get much of the way there, really as much as a third-person shooter can. What matters, though, is how movement and shooting interact with the enemies that you fight, and this really is where The Division 2 shines. Basic enemies are fantastic at flanking you, and melee enemies and grenadiers constantly try to force you out of position. Then stronger armor-wearing enemies also do appear, with each really having their own mechanical flair. The game's factions play all differently with their own way, their own enemy types, and it does make them feel sufficiently different to fight. But the real interesting gameplay comes with Black Tusk, who are the fantastically designed endgame faction of The Division, but more on them later. Then finally, there are boss enemies that have a lot of health and a lot of armor. At first, they really do sound terrible to fight, like massive bullet sponges, but in my experience, they actually are not. You see, the game is sufficiently campy to make them feel like, well, sort of a boss in Metal Gear. They're massive, chunky enemies who kind of break the rules, but they're over the top enough in design to make it work. While they are heavily armored, that armor is actually something that can be shot off, revealing weak points for extra damage. You can also do things like, say, shoot out the ammo belt of a minigun enemy, forcing them to reload. By having these various weak spots and areas that your whole team should be focusing on, these enemies don't really feel like bullet sponges. They feel like mini-bosses who demand coordination with enough going on in the fights to warrant paying attention to them. Additionally, they usually do come with adds, resulting in them forming really a larger encounter. For an example, facing waves of enemies while being chased by a heavily armored maniac with a sledgehammer is quite thrilling because of the positional gameplay. It's an example of massive games using their design toolkit very well indeed, creating a fight that is more than the sum of its parts. Of course, this weak spot-based gameplay trickles down to regular enemies, again varying with each faction. As an example, grenadiers have a grenade bag. Land a shot in that grenade bag and it will blow up 
quickly dispatching the grenadier and anyone who was standing near them. The same goes for the crazy melee rushers. If you shoot their bag of drugs, it will explode, and that will cause confusion for nearby enemies, allowing you to get the drop on them. By having enemies with extra weak points in addition to their head, the excellently implemented armor system, and varied enemy uh, types with aggressive AI, they have actually managed to make an enjoyable shooter that really is quite punishing. This absolutely is a game where if you play bad, you will die. It properly punishes you. So when this game gets real with its encounters, you really do feel properly challenged, and that absolutely is a good thing. Additionally, their combat model scales in design with player counts, so having two to four players essentially means you can have overlapping fields of fire. It means that one person can have the sledgehammer wielding maniac enemy face them, or for an example, one player could have the minigun boss shoot at them so that their ally can flank around them to shoot out their ammo belt, forcing them to reload while everybody starts to wail in on one of their weak spots. And none of this covers Black Tusk, the endgame faction, which I'll get onto later. So while I absolutely was skeptic, as was my co-reviewer Matt, we both came away rather impressed by how much massive games were able to get out of their combat system. So the core of the combat system is great, but what about the missions that you actually do? Once again, I was surprised. Missions, I think, are better called dungeons because that's essentially the role that they fill in the game. Main missions are primarily just a chain of combat encounters with very, very light storytelling. Massive have essentially nailed the balance for what works of this game. The best part of the missions is the level design, both in terms of the combat, but also in terms of the visuals. Missions in The Division 2 are basically just a string of combat arenas, with each arena throwing a different combination of um, enemies at you, or maybe with a different layout. What matters, though, is the layout of the arenas, and they typically are great. They're usually quite large, they usually feature lots of opportunities for you and the AI enemies to flank and maneuver around each other. Enemies will come at you from multiple directions, forcing repositioning, and really always just demanding situational awareness, which is very important to keeping the game engaging. Basically, it never feels like a corridor shooter. In this game, corridors are the pathway to well-designed combat areas, and that pretty much is it. Visually, I was also a bit impressed. The game generally is quite colorful, and that does extend to the missions. Further to that, Massive have done a good job of variations within the missions. As an example, there's a museum that does this really well. It brings you through many areas with different themes, again, just keeping things feeling fresh. You've got the Space Museum that has a few particularly memorable segments in it, and even when the game, say, throws you into a generic lab for its final fight, well, they kill the lights and they light the room through a massive explosion that backlights the enemy boss entrance in a way that is less Tom Clancy and more Metal Gear. So while the visuals of the game are grounded, the game does a good job with using its setting as much as it can, um, and it manages to keep things visually varied. You've got hotels, museums, underground bunkers, ports, the Capitol building. They all do feel a bit more fresh in terms of their visuals and their gameplay. More importantly, they're all used fantastically at the end game, but more on that later. So to give you a broad picture of the progression in this game, you unlock your base in the White House. Then you unlock your first settlement, which unlocks some more missions. You do those missions, and really, from that point, you are basically just doing what you want. You can complete projects, which are world-based meta objectives. You can do side missions, you can do activities such as control points, or perhaps propaganda broadcasts, or you can just start doing the main missions. The level requirements of the main missions does mean that you will have to do a broad slice of content as you level up in this game, which really does end up being a satisfying experience. As you level up, you unlock more settlements, which in turn will unlock more missions for you to do, and more side missions and all of that stuff. Side content typically, in addition to XP, gives you important rewards such as crafting blueprints, so it is pretty important to do. Then once you hit level 26, things kick up a notch with strongholds, which are similar to missions in delivery, but a bit more intense in design, featuring a higher density of elite mobs and bosses, generally being a bit more challenging. They're a fantastic step up from the regular missions, with the capital building uh, being particularly strong. Now the game ships with three of them for leveling and a final one for endgame, but massive games do plan to release more over time as the live service plan for the game rolls out. Now, as you do all of this stuff, you're upgrading your character and you're unlocking and perks and skills, with skills being the things that are mapped to your Q and E slots. The game has a fairly massive choice of skills, with each having its own archetype, and then each one of those having around four distinct variations. The core of them is really quite great, they're all well suited to team play. However, 
However, one criticism that I would have is that they do often feel quite fiddly to deploy, with animation times just being a bit too long. Still, they are a great addition to combat. Plopping down a healing aura while my friend maybe uses a turret to lay down flanking fire on the enemy or covering fire does just feel like genuinely strong team play. It all interlinks quite well, and that really is the strength of these skills. You've got healing auras, positional turrets, you've even got boosting auras that will buff your allies' combat skills. The progression through leveling overall is quite compelling, but it is also fairly self-explanatory, so I don't think there's much point in doing a big essay um, on it here. So that's really the core of the game's initial 15 to 20 hours as you make your way towards the end game. You've got a great combat system that gradually gets more intense, you've got skills and perks that you unlock at a brisk pace, and a wide variety of well-designed missions that all very much do have a gameplay focus. But what about the story? Basically, the story is a joke. It feels like a parody on purpose. I mean, you've got a side mission to get the Declaration of Independence. You're running around after the president's briefcase. The president basically says, thank God I'm not dealing with voters, let's go kick some ass. And of course, when you rescue the president, he's in a firefight against like 20 enemies. So, you know, it's like, it's not enough in this game for just people to be sad. You've got to watch an NPC comfort a little girl only to look at, up at you and implore that you kick the ass of your enemies. It's not clear enough that your enemies are bad. You've got to walk around their base to find a dogfighting ring full of dead golden retrievers. It's all absurd. And it's carried with such sincerity that it often had us roaring in laughter at how stupid it was. We actually dubbed the game's first settlement owner as Benghazi Eagle, the most tacty cool name that we could possibly think of. The tone of The Division 2 is basically what your 12-year-old self would think is cool, and that's totally fine. It's not trying to be a serious game. It's a dumb, fun game. It's got enemies that run at you on drugs with a crowbar screaming blood. So this game has drawn a lot of criticism over its political com uh, commentary. I think it has a political setting to sort of get people interested and be a starting off point that people will easily understand, but it quickly turns into axe wielding thick boys with sledgehammers and then a Metal Gear Solid invasion, all while the president uh, tells you to kick ass. So really, if you're looking for political commentary in here, you're not going to get it, you're gonna be disappointed, and maybe you're gonna write a few articles about it because that seems to be what's happening right now. So there you go, that is essentially the leveling process of The Division 2. Let's talk about Endgame because that's where this game lives or dies. So, you know that Metal Gear Solid invasion? That's Black Tusk. They basically are Metal Gear meets Boston Dynamics, and they're the centerpiece of Massive Games' Endgame plan for The Division 2. Before we cover them though, it's time to talk about loot and player progression because it really is the end game where this stuff matters. So it absolutely is a loot shooter with a loot system that I think follows the Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls model, i.e. barrage you with a massive, quantity of loot that at the very least can be broken down into crafting resources if you don't want it. What continually surprised me though is just how well implemented the loot is. Once more, Massive took a base concept that should be boring, after all we are dealing with real world weapons, and they managed to make it feel varied and exciting. That really is a hell of an achievement. So you've got two primary weapon slots and the game has many categories of weapons. Each has their own reticule and style of play. So you've got machine guns, which um, gain accuracy over time as they're fired. They're fantastic for shredding down armor and suppressing enemies, which is great for letting your allies reposition. You've got marksmanship rifles and rifles that are both high precision, having a bow bonus to headshot damage, some are bolt action, which is super satisfying to use, at least in my opinion, while others are semi-auto, with the semis having recoil that really does have to be managed. Balance-wise, a bolt action headshot is typically a one-hit kill against regular enemies and the exposed head of an armored enemy, with the mini-bosses taking a few more, so generally it feels pretty reasonable. Submachine guns are super fun, short-range laser cannons, uh, they're also great at blind fire, while assault rifles are more of a long-range variant, but with pretty bad blind fire. Shotguns, then, of course, really do reinforce that aggressive um, angle aware playstyle, I would say. Within each category, then, you've got new numerous different weapons. Each weapon kind of has its own recoil behavior and stats roll within a range, so not every M4 will be the same in terms of its mag size, its rate of fire, or its damage. Then all weapons have talents, which are basically modifiers that are applied with a number of modifiers depending on the weapon, and these typically fall into the sort of defense, offense, and skill categories, and they often have pretty interesting effects. For an example, one has the first half of your magazine having a high fire rate but low damage 
damage, and the last half of your mag having high damage but a low fire rate. Now this was incredible to use. The fast but less accurate initial burst of fire would do great damage, it would shred armor, but then the slower latter half of the mag will let you finish your enemies off with a precision shot. Really quite well designed indeed. Then another great example is a bolt action, giving you additional headshot damage tallying up for each body shot that you hit, with an extra nice feature being the UI counter of that being attached to your rifle which was really cool. So overall, the game's weapons are varied. I think they're pretty exciting um, as I was going through them, and the loot system constantly does feel engaging because of the variation, especially with just how you feel that variation in gameplay. Then on top of this, each weapon has a number of mod slots, with those mods being unlocked through um, crafting and uh, perks. So overall, it's pretty good in the weapons front. As we move on to armor, we continue to see great design. First, there are different sets, with those sets being themed after manufacturers. Having multiple bits of armor from the same manufacturer will unlock additional effects. They have an array of different talents, again, splitting into the three categories of essentially offense, defense, and skills. And the number of talents that you have in each one of those categories is tallied up, with some um, talents only working if you meet certain requirements. So it kind of balances out the gear. And overall, I'd say it works quite well, it lets you tinker with your build, and certainly it is more interesting than the past game stats, which were just electronics, firearms, and stamina. Each bit of armor then has mod slots, hell, even your, um, your offensive, like your skills have mod slots as well, and that again is just more room for customization. And then finally, once you hit endgame, you unlock your specialization, so right now they are, um, they're, they're pretty simple, like I'm going with Marksman, which gives me a super powerful um, long-ranged uh, sniper rifle while my friend, a co-reviewer, was going with a um, grenade launcher and a different build. Now, each one of those specializations essentially comes with another perk tree that you continue to unlock at endgame, which once again gives you more design space, right? More things to build your character around, and then that special um, weapon ammo actually basically just functions as a pretty darn important resource that is scarce which you want to collect during a level and use during key moments. So once again, that adds another layer of complexity onto this game once you hit the end game. And broadly, that's what The Division 2 does quite well. As you move from level 1 to level 30, and then from level 30 with low gear to level 30 with high gear, it just slowly layers on that complexity and becomes more and more rich. It very, very much is unlike the design of Anthem and I'd actually say it's one of the best designed loot systems in the genre. You really can tell that The Division 2 is a second generation loot shooter, but unlike Destiny 2, it actually learned from its predecessor, shipping with depth at launch. Then as the end game progresses, you are trying to increase your item level with the item level of gear depending on the world state. So to explain that, Let's just talk about the endgame setup of The Division 2. When you complete the final leveling stronghold, it is not the end. Why? Well, Black Tusk Invade. Now, Black Tusk are a high-tech private military company who, of course, um, are doing well from the chaos of the world of The Division. Black Tusk will take over zones and settlements in the world, and additionally, they will invade missions and strongholds. And this is where the gameplay really does kick off, and it gets kind of exciting. So let's explain the world. The world has settlements and and control points. Control points can be taken by any faction, including enemy ones and the friendly ones from settlements. The push and pull of this forms much of the game's uh, general world state, with there being, for example, resource convoys between um, control points and settlements, both enemy and ally, with you being able to defend allies and attack the resource convoys of enemies and then hand those resources in at um, control points to get time-limited bonuses. Then on top of that, events spawn into areas like propaganda broadcasts, public executions, and hostages situations, but then the end game only Black Tusk ones are a bit more hardcore. They feature things like fighting a massive air drone. Again, it's Boston Dynamics X Metal Gear, and it's pretty cool. So upon hitting level 30 and endgame, you're thrown into world state level one. This is the first kind of wave of the endgame, and this is when you find the Black Tusk have invaded a number of missions and a stronghold. Now these invaded versions of levels are the body of the endgame PvE, and thankfully, they really are fantastic. Now, many games do rely on replaying content at endgame, but The Division 2 actually does it well. Missions have their RP stripped out, their story stuff basically stripped out. The more slow-paced segments are actually streamlined to give you a very combat-focused experience. Here's a great example. In a regular mission, you had to realign a bunch of satellite dishes. It was kind of slow and involved a few waves of enemies each time. 
but it wasn't that intense. In the Black Tusk version, you've got to defend those satellite dishes. They've got health bars, and if you're not careful, Black Tusk will kill them really damn quick. The spawn rate of enemies, then, who come down with helicopters, is super fast, and that means that you have to defend with aggression, resulting in a far more tense version of the initial mission. This is also something that happens because of the design and the AI of Black Tusk. Their default troops have a more aggressive AI. They will advance their position more quickly. They will flank you more aggressively and more often. They are more varied as well. They have an array of different grenades, with one actually emitting an armor-destroying pulse that travels through cover, which forces you to move. Past that, they've got robotic dogs with a high-precision armor-destroying weapon. They have tank-tread-based drones, they have flying drones that can heal them or travel towards you and explode. They also spawn in differently, they often come down from the roof or from a helicopter with a zip line, and that seems to be something that varies their spawns a little bit, or at the very least just makes them uh, a little bit more surprising, let's just say. Now this all comes together to create levels that feel significantly harder. Black Tusk absolutely do push the mechanics of the game further, leading to properly tense scenarios. They are a fantastic addition to the game, and they absolutely do elevate the quality of the endgame missions above the initial leveling ones. This is basically one of the most intelligent reuses of game content that I've seen in quite a while. Each combat area feels different, and they do a good job at lampshading the mission's sort of invaded status, Black Tusk existence, through dialogue that explains why Black Tusk are there. So combine that with slight variations on objectives, and from a gameplay perspective, you have fresh-feeling missions. And the same does go for the Strongholds as well, which again benefit from Black Tusk's design in a similar way. So after you do your first set of invaded missions and the invaded stronghold, the world level progresses to two. That increases difficulty and reward. This happens all the way up until world level four, with five, I believe, coming as a part of the game's uh, live service roadmap. So as this happens, you're racing through the item levels to the game's current cap, and once you hit that cap, that's when you want to be focusing on specific builds. And that's where the game's crafting and modification system comes in. As an example, you can destroy a weapon in order to transfer one of its talents to another weapon, and that is something that basically lets you craft the gun of your dreams without having to rely on absurdly improbable RNG. So the combat is great, and the missions are great. It's all further elevated by the excellently designed Black Tusk faction. Basically, the core of PvE is fantastic so far, and that's with more content, including eight player raids being added in the future for free. So with PvE covered, let's talk about my personal favorite feature of this game, Dark Zones. Look, at my core, I'm a bit horrible. I love PvP that has consequences for the people that I defeat. Equally, I love the risk of the same thing happening to me. The Dark Zones provide exactly what I want. High risk, high reward, PvEVP, and it is absolutely thrilling, bringing me back to the days of running around wild using a poisoned dragon dagger in RuneScape. Dark Zones are probably, well, they are the most unique feature of this franchise. Put simply, if I think Division, I think Dark Zone. While I didn't play much of the Division 1, I love the Dark Zone in it, and I am so happy with where Dark Zones are in the Division 2. So they are PvEVP. There are enemies in strong points spread around each dark zone. Those um, points are called landmarks, so they'll contain a few waves of strongish enemies. Those enemies can drop contaminated loot. That's loot that cannot be used unless you extract it. Now, extracting a bit of loot involves going to an extraction point and calling down a helicopter. And uh, here's, here's the thing, though. Players can hold the T key and go rogue, and that lets them attack their fellow players. Yeah, the only people who you can trust are the people in your party. Anyone else, after a short animation, could betray you and kill you, dropping your valuable contaminated loot on the floor for them to pick up. Now, assuming everyone is good to each other, then you just defend the drop zone for 60 seconds against waves of enemies, then the zip line drops down, and after a tense few seconds, you attach your loot to the zip line. But then you've got another tense period of worrying. You've got to worry, will other people betray me? Will they kill me? Will they then walk up to the rope line and cut the rope, taking your loot? Really, this is the prisoner's dilemma, the game theory problem, distilled into a game mode. 
So personally, I love it. I love going rogue. I love hunting down other players. The Division 2 systems naturally extend into PvP, and uh, what's more important is just that feeling of tension. Rogue or not, as you wander around the world, your eye is at the horizon, scanning for players, watching out for ambushes. It's really damn thrilling, and it's my favorite activity in this game. And it's just so nice to see the loot shooters begin to diversify in game mode. Destiny 2 has its Gambit Prime, The Division has its Dark Zones, and they're both examples of each game doing something that feels unique and is really, really just good and special to that game. Then the final piece to this is the unnormalized dark zone. So dark zones typically normalize your numbers to create a fair environment. It actually works quite well, but that's not the case for the Black Tusk invaded dark zone. There is no normalization and the enemies are rock hard. It's just far harder. Again, more risk, but far more rewards. And the gameplay is just so tense. It's beautiful. You know, it's, it's weird. The dark zone kind of has a lot of significance because you care so much about loot, but it is just such a special game mode that I kind of wish it existed outside of the loot shooter, which really is an odd dilemma. Basically though, I love Dark Zones. They are doing everything that I want them to do. I really like the new features that they've added to the Dark Zone, like the Den of Thieves. I think, you know, chasing that down is, is just really fun. I mean, overall, I, man, the Dark Zones are so cool. As Again, it's the unique thing that makes the division special. It sets it apart, and it's a, an example of design innovation right? It's not a run-of-the-mill feature that you find in every game. It's something that's unique and special, and massive games have to be commended for actually just having the balls to do that. Of course, that's actually not it for PvP in this game, with The Division 2 actually shipping Conflict, which is a new, queued PvP mode that has a few different game modes. Look, it's the thing that I have the least experience with in this game, and I can say that I, at the core, like it. The game systems naturally extend over to a PvP setting, but what was particularly noticeable to me is how almost every match snowballs. Essentially, a 4v4 with pre-made teams would just be fantastic, right? With really tense positional play and tactical depth. And I've had a little bit of that and it's been great. But a match with a pre-made against randoms is not worth playing. Bar specific near one-shot kill builds, it's very hard to carry as compared to other games, so the solo queue experience is really quite bad. Now, this could be solved by better matchmaking, but so far, it's rather mixed. So, the unbalanced matches were frustrating, but the few times that I did get into an extended firefight, it was actually quite thrilling and a bit tense as the enemy advanced on us. The mechanics of The Division just make for this slow and tense type of gameplay where both teams are trying to figure out the right positioning that'll give them the advantage that they need to allow maybe one player to do the big flanking maneuver that sets it all off. Now, I don't think the mode is quite there yet, but I think there is a strong gameplay core that can be expanded upon. And then finally, I just want to call out what I'm going to call player-facing intelligent design. That doesn't roll off the tongue, but what I'm getting at here is the nice little design inclusions that really just show you the developers know how their game is being played. First, the UI. Look, the UI is quite annoying and uh, like the double clicks that are needed in PC are just dumb. So there's a lot of dumb there, but underneath the clunky UI, there are great usability features. What do I mean by this? Well, tapping V to mark loot as junk so that you can mass disassemble loot. Being able to pick up loot as junk. The easy comparison tools. Yes, the UI UI itself is obtuse, but underneath it, Massive have implemented a great number of quality of life features that really should be industry standards. Then for the combat UI, it's quite nice. You have a health bar and um, ability information that is positioned quite close to where your eye will be looking. The same goes for ammunition, which is actually displayed on your reticle. It's the World of Warcraft equivalent of having well-positioned combat ores. I mean, hell, the talents that say involve tallying up headshots to in or body shots to increase your headshot damage have numbers that are displayed on your weapon, which is a great feature. Past that, the fast travel is very liberal indeed. Um, if an ally runs into a mission, you can just hold the Z key and teleport to them in the mission. So generally, it's a very gameplay focused game that is aware of how people engage with it. I mean, hell, they even have a firing range that includes time to kill and DPS tracking. Now, there is more to talk about with this game in general, but I really think it's about time we wrapped up. You've probably noticed that I've been nearly universally positive about this game, so you might be wondering why I cannot universally recommend it. And it's really simple. This is a genre title. It's a loot shooter through and through. For people who don't like that style of game, it basically offers you nothing. The story is essentially non-existent. 
So instead, what I would say is that if you like loot shooters and you like third-person cover combat systems, this is the best game on the market for that. It's got a really large array of features, it has a robust endgame, a solid content roadmap, and the wholly unique Dark Zones. This is a game that is designed for its target audience, absolutely. If you're in that target audience, massive games have really just went all in for you. So you'll probably love it. But if you're not in that audience, you probably won't. And that's something you likely know anyway. If I review this overall as a game that has to perform many jobs for a broad audience, it would probably review low, but that would be missing the point. This has one job as a game, and that is to be another entry in the loot shooter market. Unlike Destiny 2 that simplified itself for a broad audience at launch, The Division 2 tightened its systems, it refined its designs without simplifying them, in my opinion, and that led to a game that shipped with depth. No loot shooter has launched in a better state than this one, so for fans of the genre, I can wholeheartedly recommend it. I mean, hell, if the gameplay is up your alley, I can certainly recommend trying it out even if you're not used to loot shooters, with the one qualifier being you really do need to have friends to play this. The positional gameplay of its combat is just so core that with one player, it's not, like, it's, it's okay, but it shines with more players. So overall, hats off to Ubisoft. They, in my estimation, have, I'd say, the joint first most robust premium loot shooter on the market, along with Bungie's Destiny 2. They have one of the best competitive shooters of, you know what, the last two decades with Rainbow Six Siege, which is a beautiful game. And with both games, we've seen them commit to robust post-launch support. They're one of the companies who seem to actually be doing well with the live service model. Time will tell, but right now, the future looks bright for The Division 2. So, if you enjoyed this video, then consider checking out the rest of this channel. We have daily gaming news coverage, bi-weekly news recaps like the Philip DeFranco show, but for gaming, and with a lot more planned past that. Then if you'd like to see more about The Division, I'd recommend checking out a YouTuber called Marco Style. Basically, he does for The Division what I do for Warcraft on my other channels. So really extensive in-depth coverage. If you'd like to learn more about this game or your current player who um, just wants to learn more about systems, I found his content to be a great help, so I recommend you check him out. There you go. That is it for my review of The Division 2. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you think down below. And with all that said, I will see you next time.